The devil's going to get you. The devil's going to get you. These were the unnerved whisperings on the streets of Liverpool in the 1980s. In some of the most deprived ghettos in the United Kingdom, the streets belonged to one man and one man alone. At the age of 11, he was a convicted car thief. At 13, a burglar. At 15, a street mugger. At 23, an armed robber. And by 26, an underworld extortionist, making hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds a week by extorting and robbing drug dealers. As a former British and European world kickboxing champion, he knew how to intimidate people and inflict searing pain in a heartbeat. All he had to do was simply lift up his balaclava and say, it is me, the devil. What are you going to do about it? Konnichiwa. For those of you who don't know who I am, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Stephen French. This is the story of Stephen French, a.k.a. The Devil. Born on October the 8th, 1959, Stephen's life was troubled from the start. His father, Thomas Benjamin French, was a West Indian seafarer who fled to the UK after committing murder. His mother, Vera Hughes, was an Irish immigrant and was left alone to raise her five children after Thomas had an affair with the babysitter. Struggling under the pressure of raising five children from three different fathers, Vera was deemed unable to cope and Stephen was placed into care at just seven years old. His elder three siblings were placed with another family in foster care, but due to their race, Stephen and his older brother, Tony, were sent to a different care home. Stephen lived under terrible conditions in the care home, which felt, to him, more like an orphanage. He described a childhood filled with ruthless bullying, assault, and racism, something he believes led to a life of crime. In fact, the care home Stephen was placed in was shut down in the 1980s, with many of its former staff being tried and charged for cases of child abuse and sexual assault. Stephen even claims to have been the victim of Jimmy Savile, a convicted British pedophile. In his early teenage years, Stephen continually ran away from various care homes and got involved in Liverpool gang culture. At just the young age of 11, he received his first conviction for car theft, and at just 13 years old, he claimed to have been burglarizing two houses a week. Given his unstable and violent upbringing and role in teenage, racialized gang culture, it is possibly surprising that Stephen excelled at school, particularly in maths, science, and history. His academic-oriented brain led him to experience an internal conflict about good and evil, seeking discipline and a better outlet for his rage, and after watching Bruce Lee in the film Enter the Dragon, Stephen stepped foot into Liverpool's Shaolin Karate Club for the first time. It was here that Stephen met Sensei Ronnie Colwell, an ex-SAS military trainer in martial arts and the founding father of British karate. Sensei Colwell took the young Stephen under his wing, saw potential, and quickly became a father figure and mentor. Eventually, Stephen transitioned into kickboxing and went on to become British, European, and even world kickboxing champion. Although the main reason for the club was to teach physical, mental, and spiritual discipline and well-being, unbeknownst to Ronnie, it was inadvertently responsible for rallying together young, black, and angry men, forming a new generation of criminals. It was within the karate club Stephen met his blood brother, Andrew John, for the first time. Someone we'll return to later. In 1981, when Stephen was 21, racial tensions in Liverpool were at their height. The streets were filled with racial violence and police were making many false arrests on members of the black community. This escalated on July 3rd, 1981 with the Toxteth riots. Events were catalyzed when a police car was pushed down a hill and set alight. For the next nine days, sustained violence and rioting took over the streets. One civilian was killed, 468 police officers were injured, 500 people were arrested, and 70 buildings were destroyed. The front line of the riots were in Upper Parliament Street, and Stephen was at the epicenter. He ripped off policemen's stripes and wore them as trophies. He grabbed a bin lid and a table leg and thrashed them together in a rhythmic call to arms. Everyone around him followed suit. Police quickly fled at the sound, and Stephen let out a primeval roar. The devil was born. A few years after the riots, when Stephen was 23, his dive into crime escalated as he got involved in a number of high-profile armed robberies. Wearing balaclavas and dark overalls, Stephen and his men raided a bank in broad daylight and stole 20,000 pounds. The security alarms sounded and the police were hot on their tails. Always thinking 10 steps ahead and always with a few tricks up his sleeve, quick-witted Stephen was wearing a sports outfit underneath his overalls. 
He managed to quickly change his clothes and jogged past the onslaught of police cars like nothing had happened. In his mid-twenties, Stephen was a regular customer of his favorite bar, Kirkland's. At this time, even after the riots, there was still a lot of racial tension, and Stephen noticed that the security guard was letting white people in for free, but charging an entry for people of color. Not having any of it, Stephen attacked him from the front, and his blood brother, Andrew, grabbed him from behind, leaving the guard unconscious on the floor. Together, they took over the door inviting people of color into the club, and they all sat and ordered champagne at the bar, celebrating their victory over white oppression. Marcelo Pol, the millionaire bar owner, saw what happened and took a shine to Stephen. Before he knew it, Stephen and Andrew both had new jobs as security guards. Stephen describes his time as a security guard as a crash course in drug dealing. Since there was a lot of drug-related activity happening within the Liverpool clubs in the 1980s, he made a rule that if dealers wanted to deal in the clubs, they had to pay him some money up front at the door. Through this initiative, he made an additional 20 to 50 pounds every night. While working on the door, he kept hearing stories of how drugs kept being stolen. In one instance, he took it upon himself to successfully steal them back, and word started to spread that he provided protection for drug dealers. Jobs and commissions for recovering narco debt started flooding in, but Stephen and Andrew had their own idea. Why wait for people to ask for help to retrieve their stolen goods if you could also rob the drug dealers directly? After all, it's not as if they could go to the police and complain about it. That is when his role as a tax man began, where he became a kind of Robin Hood of organized crime. With taxation, you target the bad guys and steal money directly from drug dealers. This gave Stephen a fearsome reputation and left drug dealers shaking with fear, wondering whether Stephen, the devil, would come knocking. To ensure success, he followed five simple rules. One, never tax the same person twice. Two, never chase dead money. Three, never give the goods back once you've stolen them. Four, never tax someone you know. Five, never leave physical evidence behind. After that, anything goes. As drug dealers couldn't go to the police because of their own criminal involvement, Stephen was safe and got away with it for years. According to Stephen, unreported crime was the best crime, and his list of criminal convictions were fairly minimal as a result. Breaking into drug dealers' homes, Stephen used violence to intimidate and overpower them. Once they were restrained, he forced them to hear the following words, although his version had a lot more swearing. I hate drug dealers. I hate people that sell drugs to children in their own communities. But I love money. I'm here to relieve you of your cash. If you don't give me your cash, really horrible things are going to happen to you. You are poisoning communities. You're killing people, and you're getting fat and rich off of it, and that disgusts me. The dealer then received very, very clear instructions on how to proceed. So I've got a phone here that's never been used. You're going to call your stash man, whether it's your granny, your ma, your bird, your best pal, you're going to tell them, in about an hour, someone's going to pick up the money. If they didn't dial a number and dial it fast, the consequences were unspeakable. On average, Stephen taxed a dealer a week and reportedly made over 20 million pounds in the 80s and 90s. But soon, Stephen experienced a devastating blow, which changed his life trajectory forever. Stephen met his blood brother, Andrew John in Liverpool's Shaolin Karate Club when they were teenagers. They instantly hit it off and became best friends, working as security guards and eventually teaming up to become drug tax men together. In 1991, when 28-year-old Stephen was doing a short stint in prison for blackmail, his cellmate delivered some terrible news. Frenchie, some lad's been killed from your neck of the woods. Do you know him? A frantic Stephen asked, what's his name? His cellmate replied, Andrew John shot dead in Liverpool. Stephen instantly phoned his mother who provided more details. He quickly learned that a man named Val, someone Stephen had a brief altercation with after a mistake in taxation, had sneaked up behind Andrew and struck him four times in the back. Stephen and Val had made up after their run-in. Andrew, however, couldn't let it go and continued to threaten and extort him until the day Val enacted his revenge. Upon hearing that he wasn't allowed to leave and attend Andrew's funeral, in a fit of rage, Stephen assaulted the prison guards and spent the day of the burial in solitary confinement. It was in these quiet moments of self-reflection that Stephen vowed to turn his life around. Well, it was a promise not quite kept. Whilst in jail, he gave all his money to some trusted allies for safekeeping, but they invested the money in a huge drugs buy, which fell through, leaving Stephen with £25,000 to his name when he was released from prison. 
With mortgages to pay and a new family to support, given the birth of his daughter Abby in 1994, Stephen made a desperate and drastic decision. Despite his utter disgust and hatred for drug dealers, Stephen knew it was a way to make money, fast. In a major U-turn, Stephen made the decision to turn his hand to drug dealing and knew exactly the man to contact. Curtis Warren at the time was the single biggest drug trafficker in Britain. The two of them met as teenagers, and it was actually Stephen who kickstarted his criminal career when he recruited him into his gang and helped him carry out his first burglary. Make sure to check out the video I made about Curtis Warren. His story is quite interesting as well. The two men had always kept in contact, and they covertly met in Dublin where Stephen purchased and retrieved high quantities of cocaine. This lasted a few years and made Stephen a huge amount of money. However, in 1996, Curtis was jailed for attempting to import 125 million pounds of cocaine and Stephen lost his supplier. With the loss of Andrew John still on his mind, with Curtis in prison and a now two-year-old daughter to take care of, Stephen again tried to turn his life around. He vowed to get out of the drugs trade and stay out of trouble. There must have been a way he could take what he learned as a taxman and apply it to legitimate business, right? There was, and Stephen built his own business around legitimate debt recovery loan arbitration, and security negotiation. Over the next few years, he became Britain's number one legitimate debt collector, recovering millions and millions of pounds worth of debt that had previously been classified as irretrievable. His business was valued at over 7.5 million pounds. In memory of Andrew, Stephen also worked with criminologists and academics to spread the anti-gun message, encouraging young people to lay down their firearms and embrace education. Perhaps the devil did have an angelic side. But no matter how much he wanted to keep his life peaceful and pure, the demons and the beast inside him were always trying to pull him back. In 2009, he went to jail for three years for possession of a knife and threats of assault. In 2013, he went back in for two years after assaulting a businessman with a pistol. And in 2016, he faced two allegations of rape. It seems Stephen was always tempted by the darkness and could never fully stay out of trouble. The story of Stephen French is such a curious one that shows his dilemma between good and evil. You cannot help but sympathize with a lost young boy thrown from care home to care home. You can't help but admire a young man who protested and fought for racial equality. You can't help but be inspired by a man who campaigned against gun crime in memory of his best friend. But on the other hand, can you support a man who enacted violence, extorted people for money, and committed other devastating crimes? So, on the scale of good to evil, Tell me where you think Stephen French sits. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe. It immensely helps the channel. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.